to, to sing that freedom song again, but I, I want you to realize there are more dimensions to being free than you might even realize tonight. You see, we're not, we're not just talking about being free to worship God or free to dance. We're talking about being free from the bondage of sin. Thank you, Lord. We're, we're talking about being free from peer pressure and the fear of man, free to do the will of God, free to go for it. And we're, we're just going to sing it again, but just with a little bit of a different kind of exclamation point on it. This is for young people, this is for middle-aged people, this is for old people. Amen? And uh, John McCormick, if you're feeling free tonight as a... Just, just come on up here. We're, we're getting a few folks here. John. This is a, what, the middle age? 60. All right, this is a free 60-year-old. Now, uh -huh. perhaps, perhaps you're here, a student in the school of ministry, and you didn't enroll in the school until you were past 70, and you're in school right now, why don't you come on up here? And Bless your Lord. 
Bless you, Lord. Whoever you are here tonight, God's ready to change you. And uh, we, we had a neat little thing happen on campus today. I just got this report. This is the life that we live around here. Uh, Gunter, if you're here, you can raise your hand. But, but somebody came on campus today, came onto the campus, and, uh, and said, the students from this school have been witnessing to me on Friday nights. And uh, I've been running from them. I've been avoiding it but I need to get saved, and gave his life to Jesus right on the campus. Woo! Yes, Jesus, we're free, free from sin, free from fear, free to do your will, free to run our race. Hallelujah. Let's, let's sing that through again, and if there are a few more students from the school that want to join us on the platform here just for a bit, that's all right. Just from the School of Ministry, if you want to jump up here, that's fine. Where the Spirit of the Lord is there.
Jesus, we want you to be glorified. Hey, Yahweh. Hey, Yahweh, Kumama. Hallelujah. Now, just don't mix up the two or you'll say Muggy Mama. <laughs> Yahweh, Muggy Mama. Thank you, Jesus, for your joy. Thank you, Lord. We receive your joy, O oh Lord. Your liberating joy, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. O oh God of Brian, cleansing flame, send your blood bought gift. Today we claim Send the fire
let's consciously lay ourselves on his holy altar and ask him to send his fire. Ask him to send his fire on your sacrifice tonight, on your life offered up to him. Ask him to burn away any dross in your life, to burn away the sin, to ignite a fresh passion, for the lukewarm to be set ablaze, for the cold to be awakened, for the on fire to be strengthened and encouraged. Just lift your voices in worship and prayer. Here we are, Lord.
destroy us, oh Lord, but it's the fire of your love. Thank you, Jesus. We're crying out for that fire of your love. The only thing that could satisfy us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. My soul rests in you. My soul rests in you.
Desire for you, 
Just open your heart to him right now. And just let him just come in and let him have his way. He may want to just bathe you in his love. Right now, if you can just imagine, you're the most important object to him at this very moment. Right now, you are. You're, you're the most important thing on his mind and heart right now. Wherever you are, whatever you're carrying, whatever you're struggling with, whatever you may be going through, right now, in all the universe, there's nothing that attracts him more than the heart that's hungering after him. You, you don't have to press. All you have to do is just surrender. And that's his message to us right now tonight, to just surrender to his presence. Just, just open your heart to him. You say, well, how do I do that? J just begin to tell him you love him. And just begin to just uh, open up and say, Lord, have your way with me. What, whatever you want from me. You see, let him, he'll define it. He'll define it. He'll, he'll define what he's going to do with your life. He'll, he'll define where he's going to take you. He knows what he wants. But, but you could just open your heart and say, God, here, here I am. Here I am, Lord. Holy God. Lord, we just gathered here to honor you. The most important thing in our heart right now is just to love you, Jesus, and to tell you that we love you. We're not asking anything from you except your presence. Lord, we have many needs in this place. But right now, Lord, we choose just to love you, just to embrace you, Almighty God. And Lord, as, as we just come before you, we want to thank you. We just want to thank you, Lord, that right now we're, we're in the Holy of Holies. We're in the place that you've designed for us to live and to be. We want to thank you, Lord, that all we can offer you are empty hands and a hungry heart. And that's what we give you right now is a hungry heart. Holy God. Holy God. Just let him embrace you right now. I tell you, the Holy Spirit is here just to embrace you. Regardless of where you are, if you're in this place tonight and you don't really know him, he's here to embrace you. He can break all the hardness in the heart. He can tear down every wall, every barrier. If you're hurt in this place, you've been maybe hurt by a person, you've been hurt by a church, and it's time just to surrender it all and say, God, here I am. He knows where you are. Maybe, maybe if you're going through a lot of doubts and, and a lot of fears, perhaps not even expressed to anybody, but they're there. The Holy Spirit is here just, just to bring you in, draw you in. That's what he's doing right now. That's what he's... That's what he's calling us to, just to draw us in. Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit of God. Oh, how we love you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Holy, holy God. Jesus, Jesus. You know, you don't have to give up. All you have to do is just let him carry you further, strengthen you. Holy God. 
Holy God, all over this place, Holy Spirit, manifest yourself to us, Lord. To every individual heart, hear God, just, Lord, bring a fresh manifestation of your presence. So often, Lord, we receive you corporately, but I just believe you've singled out every single heart in this place. Just bring that personal manifestation of your presence, oh God. You're the great shepherd. Holy Lord. Mighty, mighty God. You just cannot calculate the change that can take place in a divine moment like this. Where, where some of you may feel tears and others may not feel anything. You, you just cannot calculate the change that can take place in a moment just of being like this in his presence. So often we're just waiting for something to happen so we can kind of move on. There are times when he just wants us to sit and, and just bathe in his presence. Holy God. Holy God, Jesus. Could we just open our hearts in thanksgiving to the Lord? Think about where you would be if he had not rescued you. Where would you be right now? Some, some of us probably wouldn't even be alive. Where would you be right now? What, what would be controlling you if, if Jesus had not rescued you? Where would you be? Let's, let's just offer up to him just a thanksgiving as you just begin to thank him. Maybe he's done something real recent in your life and you just want to thank him. Maybe you're hurting right now and he doesn't seem to be doing anything, but that's the time to thank him. It's the time just to lift up his holy name with no strings attached and just exclaim to him, Lord, thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for delivering me. Thank you for setting me free. Lord, thank you for my family. Thank you. Thank you, mighty God, for your promises. Holy Lord, we just thank you. Just offer, just offer thanks to him right now. Just, just begin to love on him and, and, and offer thanks to him. Holy God, holy God, Jesus, your sweet presence, Lord. We thank you for your presence. Thank you for touching us, oh God, for rescuing us. Thank you for loving us and dying for us on the cross. Holy God. Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that no matter where we are underneath of the everlasting arms. Mighty God, mighty God. Holy Lord, Jesus. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh my soul, rejoice. 
it wouldn't disrupt your worship to stand, let's stand and offer this one more time to the Lord. your name. We join the angels and we bless your name. We join your people right now on every continent. And we bless your name. We thank you because you're worthy. Because you're worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy.
Bless you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Briande. Bless you, God. Bless you, Lord. Holy, holy, holy. Kadosh, 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 Aranatsvot. Holy, 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 Lord God. Holy, 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 Lord God. Ribi Namanayu, Meloko Hearts, Kvodecha. None like you, Lord, filling the earth with your glory. We bless you. We bless you. Let it rise to heaven. Let it rise from the depths of your being to the throne of God. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you. We bless you, God. We bless you, God. We bless you, God. We bless you, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Just feel we need to do one more thing this, this week in our missions week at school. We've been focusing on Islam. More than 1.2 billion people who don't know the Lord, who've never experienced the sweetness of the presence of God that you've just experienced. And Jesus said that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of Islam will not prevail against it. And let's just lift our voices. We've been doing it through this week. Let's just do it again for the salvation of the Islamic peoples, for the salvation of those Muslims nominal and fanatical around the world. God have mercy. God have mercy. God have mercy. this night that Islam shall fall before the mighty name of Jesus. 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 I brought a, want our brother Irvin to come just to either seal this prayer, or to pray in English, or to pray in Indonesian, or to proclaim, or to prophesy, or whatever is in your spirit. Just seal this time. Tuhan Yesus, 
Kami semuanya setuju dengan firmanmu bahwa ribu-ribu dan miliar-miliar orang-orang di dalam negeri-negeri yang penuh dengan orang Indonesia di situ dapat mengerti kehendakmu dan orang-orang Islam dapat mengerti bahwa Yesus Jerusalemnya yang indah oh father by your spirit we do agree that the 1.2 billion people in the world of Islam will declare Jesus as lord and will bow the knee and will cry out to the glory of God the father Jesus is my Savior, Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my Redeemer, Jesus is my salvation and I declare that the blood and the spirit and the word of the living God will cause Islam to bow at the cross of Jesus Christ and be free and be free and be free and be free and dance in the spirit and proclaim the joy of the Lord and rejoice in the authority of his living word and be lifted up with the shout of praise that all Islam has declared Jesus is the son of the living God we agree with your spirit your word and your blood release your glory upon the world of Islam in Jesus mighty name hallelujah 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 declare this out loud with me heavenly father we believe your word that the end of a thing is greater than the beginning and in the midst of darkness your light will shine your glory will fill the earth out of every nation out of every tribe out of every tongue you will get for yourself a holy people and the nations shall be filled with your glory and Islam shall bow its knee to the Lordship of Jesus and Hinduism and Buddhism and materialism and atheism and communism will bow their knees to the Lordship of Jesus and America shall be shaken and revival fires shall spread to the ends of the earth and Israel shall be saved hallelujah you of something statistics we often mention to people I'm fully aware of the darkness that's in the land fully aware of the sin that's in the world I've written about the junk as much as anybody has we're aware of it we grieve over it we preach against it we see degeneration and sin and moral decline all around but we also see what the Spirit of God is doing I want to remind you of something that's estimated by students of missions history that at the end of the first century there was one believer on the earth for every 360 people think of that one believer on the earth for every 360 people God was moving powerfully the book of Acts all that one believer for every 360 people we can jump way ahead 
Jump to the end of the 1800s, a great mission century. Workers going around the world, the gospel spreading, people sacrificing their lives for souls. At the end of the 1800s, it's estimated that there's one believer for every 27 people. I want you to understand that at the end of this last century, the century we've just ended, there's better than one believer for every six people, maybe one believer for every five people. The church of Jesus is advancing in power. And if there's ever a day to be alive, it's this day, this hour. Amen? Praise God. You can turn to Psalm 42. The seagulls have tapes available if you're interested in the foyer. You can get those after church, uh, after the message and the response. Uh, they won't be available till then, right? Right, not till then. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God for his presence. Oh, yama hurushi mauni. Praise the Lord. Happy birthday to Dr. Brown. Amen. <laughs> Michael 316. And uh, we have our new baby in the house tonight, too. Faith Rose is her name. Wave at us, Gina. Faith Rose. God told me she'll be a sign and wonder in Israel. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm happy that I serve the true God. I'm happy that I'm not running around like a blind fool worshiping false gods, the manifestations of demons in this age. I thank God for that. I'm happy that our God is the true God, that I could actually go into my secret place and bow my knee anytime and know that I'm worshiping my Father who is God. And there is no other God but the one to whom I bow my knee. He's from everlasting to everlasting. He's the maker of the ends of the earth. He's called Most High, the only true God. And we worship him in his house. I believe that. I know that. But still, Islam and incomplete Judaism and Buddhism and Hinduism and atheism and materialism and everything else you quoted are still asking, well then, where is he? If he's that great and that eternal, then we want to know, where is your God? Where are all the marvelous things we've read about? Are they fables? Have you fallen short? Please understand, I thank God for everything he's doing. These are the greatest days to live in. Even now, statistically. But we haven't even tapped into a fraction of the full potential of the God whose name is Yahweh, who is from everlasting to everlasting, the one who always was, always is, and is always about to do something. And I believe we have to take that question to heart and ask it of ourselves from deep within in his presence. I'd like to read from Psalm 42 a few verses, and then we're going to move over to Romans chapter 11 and read a few more verses, and then we'll be done with the preface to the introduction of my message. <laughs> As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O oh God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Friend, what is it about the psalmist that he would have to use the analogy of water to represent God? That there's something so deep and intimate in his communion that he needed, that he had to parallel it with drinking. When shall I come and appear before God? In verse 3, he says, My tears 
have been my food day and night. Can you listen to this as a song? I doubt this had that hip hop to it. My tears have been my food day and night. This is not a song he wanted to sing, friend. This is a song he had to sing. Any of you ever sung a song like that? While they say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember and pour out my soul within me. These things I remember and I keep flipping the channels. These things I remember and I go to another football game. These things I remember and I consult my Christian psychologist. No, these things I remember and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you in despair, my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him for the help of his presence. Oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. And in verse 7, the title of this message is Deep Cries to Deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. And now in Romans chapter 11, Verse 32. Great and mighty Holy Spirit. Royal Spirit of God. King Jesus. Great Father. Have complete control and send your fire. Consume us. Yet let us not be burned away. Romans 11.32. This is a striking statement from the Apostle Paul. At the end of an involved Discourse about the mystery of the rejection of the Messiah by the Jewish people and the mystery that the nations who had no God that was the true God beforehand therefore received the true God and the Messiah while the Jews, of all things, rejected him. The irony is, is too thick even to try to articulate, I think even for Paul in a sense. In fact, it was so thick, he, he didn't despair completely. He somehow saw the hand of God in it. And in verse 32, he says, For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. Not for one moment diminishing the power of the free will of any man, and in this context, the Jewish people. Not for one moment blaming God for their rejection, but maintaining indignity. Adam's free will to reject God's laws and then the reality of his Messiah when he came. Still somehow in all of that, simultaneously in the mind of Paul, saw the hand of God hardening a nation partially so that the other nations could receive the treasure. But only so that after that, the original nation would be saved in Messiah as a nation and then God would be all in all. Somehow the tragedy of a misplaced free will becomes the glory of God's counsel. And instead of trying to explain it away at this point and defending one side or the other, he lets them both stand clear, free will and the sovereignty of God, and drops to his knees and raises his hands and lifts his voice in worship. Not in theological cheap explanation. Something deeper. He worships. And these are the words he says in verse 33. Oh, the depth. Friend, this was not 
just a superficial TV preacher. Not that, not that all TV preachers are superficial. Especially with cameras around here. This was a Jew who would have wished himself accursed for the sake of his people. Not just because he loved them, but that's certainly part of the heart. But because he knew they were the key to history. And this man loved God. So when he says, oh, the depth, that's just not rhetoric, friend. He has nothing else to say except, oh, the depth of the wealth and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Or who has given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. May the Lord speak out of his depths tonight. May the Lord take us to a new place in him. Students, are you with me? Are you going to help me stretch these borders out? Let's just take the walls of our limitations and crash them tonight. Are you going to be with me? We got some wonderful visitors with us, friends. Students who need you to be with me tonight and who need you to help crash these borders open for them. There are people here who are believers who are thirsty, who are unbelievers who are thirsty. They don't even know why they're here, but they're thirsty if they'll listen. And I need you to stick with me all the way to the end and just barrel through these walls of limitations. Deep Christ to deep. I want to consider these things in reverse order. Wealth, wisdom, and knowledge. Friend, the knowledge of God is deep. <laughs> Do you know that God wants you to know about the things of God? He does not want you to be ignorant. In fact, Paul says several times, in various contexts, one of them is Romans 11, I don't want you to be ignorant. Several times, I don't want you to be ignorant. Without knowledge, the people perish. So many false religions base their idea of salvation not only on works, but on knowing certain secrets and as you know certain secrets you can go farther and farther into the depths of that religion and that's the way they catch you they bait and hook well that is a sinister twist on something that's genuine and that's holy in true faith in Jesus Christ God wants us to grow in deeper knowledge when second Peter was laying out for us uh, second Peter yes when Peter in, in second Peter chapter 1, was laying out for us the list of the virtues that we are to embrace and make our own and increase in. He says, add to your faith moral virtue. The first thing we must work on is our character. And then the next thing is, and add to your moral virtue, knowledge. God wants us to be acquainted with the things of God. Intimately acquainted. Paul says that the, we, we have not received the spirit who's from the world, but we receive the spirit who's from God so that we might know the things freely given to us by God. We got it all, we just don't know it. Jesus told his disciples, you know the way where I'm going. They said, well, how could we know the way? We don't know the way. They, they did know the way and they didn't know they knew the way because they were thinking with their carnal mind and not with the mind of Christ. So he says, we have the Spirit so that we might know the things freely given to us by God, for the Spirit searches all things. The Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Think of it. You have the Spirit of God who searches all things. Right now, the Spirit of God 
is the most pure and perfect investigative reporter in the universe. He knows it all. We've been studying revolutions because we're calling people to a holy and biblical revolution. But when revolutions have risen up in different nations, different parts of the world, they always begin in secret. Usually they do. People will meet in some side room, perhaps during a wedding or something, and they'll discuss their plans and, and, and where they're going to get their money and where they're going to buy their munitions from and then how they're going to train an army and where they're going to train an army and how they're going to stay outside of other nations' intelligence or their government and on and on and on and on and on. And it's all done in secret. But there's somebody at that meeting who's writing down every detail. He knows every thought. He knows every motive. He knows every bit of background of every person there. And when they're done, he goes back to the Father, and the Father knows the whole thing. The Scripture says that the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. Friend, the knowledge of God is deep. I can imagine the devil calling a conference in his war room wherever that is in the pit of hell. Calling some of his key warlords, maybe he wants to strategize to come up with a plan to bring down maybe the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. And they're going to plan this thing out, man. They're going to take months. And they're going to go for it. They're going to sit there for months until they have a flawless plan. Not only are they going to take months, but the devil's masterminded this thing where he's going to allow the plan itself to unfold over about maybe five years. It's not going to be some sudden crash. He's going to dispatch a few of his little critters on this key person and just start to wear him down a little bit over here. He's going to have to wear down another one over there. Start to sow seeds of just a little doubt and a little complaining in one corner. No big deal, but just enough so that after about five years, all he has to do is pull the plug, and then bam, what he's been working on for five years comes to pass. So they mastermind this thing in their conference room. After months, they plan it out. They each have a post. They each have someone they're assigned to. And then the devil says, all right, we are done. We've taken months with this thing. He dispatches them all. They all leave the conference room. It's empty, except now there is still one spirit there that he didn't notice before. The devil said, what are, what are you doing here? And the Holy Spirit says, I'm everywhere, man. <laughs> and thanks for the details on your little plan there. <laughs> Off he goes a couple of weeks later. Some prayer meeting, maybe the middle of the night, Friday, in the orange, a couple, couple of intercessors like, oh, I, I sense something, yeah, <laughs> I see a dark cloud coming, I bear witness, I bear witness, you know how the intercessors now start to get a little weird, I think we all need to lock arms and pray in tongues and move like this, okay, friend, as long as it's an act of intercession and you're doing it, go for it. A few other key people bear witness. We call a fast for a couple of days. We spend a week in intensive fasting and prayer. And this big old plan. Big old cloud coming at us. Whoosh, dust in the wind. Because the knowledge of God is deep. And we have the mind of Christ. <laughs> that old king of Aram kept trying to ambush Israel. And everywhere he was going to go put his camp, he'd explain it to his servants. And somehow, if you know the story, you know how in 2 Kings 6, Israel would find out and not camp there or would guard themselves properly. So the king of Aram gathers his servants and says, all right, thanks a lot, guys. Which one of you is for them and not for me? And one of them says, oh, we're not conspiring against you. It's that prophet Elisha. He lives in your bedroom with you. <laughs> if I remember right, isn't it John G. Lake that sometimes as he was teaching spontaneously would give a detailed historical illustration of his sermon. He would, he would retell an event in history that he never learned. 
It kept happening, and so he tried to catch himself from doing it because it felt like he was making them up, right? But he had someone check it out. They had someone who could research it, and they did, and found out that every event occurred and the details were accurate. Talk about a word of knowledge. Friend, God wants you to be able to tap into this knowledge. God wants you to have access to the mind of the Messiah. Depend on the, the tired, learning, and dry intellectualism of this world. The knowledge of God is deep. So how do we tap into it? Deep cries to deep. The wisdom of God is deep. Do you realize that God wants you to be wise? That it's not just for King Solomon or the sages and the debaters and the people you students have seen on the, the screen as you watch these debates of these masterminds go at one another. Dr. Brown does it with rabbis. Our, our, doc, uh, our, our, our brother, Dr. Anish Sharosh, does it with his counterparts in the Muslim world. And you think, well, man, you know, uh, they know what to do. They know just how to answer the right question. Friend, God wants you to be wise too. God wants you to be capable strategists for the kingdom of heaven. Basically, biblical wisdom is the way to a full divine life. But I'm telling you, the wisdom of God is not the wisdom of this age. See, the wisdom of God was with Jesus Christ. He knew how to minister in the wisdom of God and not the wisdom of men. Jesus did not study marketing techniques in order to make his message appealing to bait and hook people in. He had real wisdom. See, what's wise to the world is foolish to God. And what's foolish to the world is wise to God. The wisdom of the world would not have been silent like Jesus when he was falsely accused. It would have defended itself. But Jesus knew the way. The wisdom of the world would have proven its majesty and power on the cross. But Jesus took the way of shame and foolishness because he knew the way of wisdom. But friend, the world also would have stayed buried in the earth. But Jesus was raised from the dead because he had wisdom and he understood the wisdom of the cross, though it's foolishness to men. He said, if you want to be great, become a servant because the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That's the opposite of the world. And the, the one who, who, who exalts himself will be humbled. In the kingdom of God, the king is a servant. That's what a king is. And a servant is a king. Don't buy into the wisdom of the world, friend. Listen to the wisdom of the Holy Spirit as it's whispered to you. We see this much. We see this much, friend. You're trying to accomplish something. Or maybe you're trying to solve some dilemma. We're trying to strategize for global evangelization. We see this much of the picture with our natural eyes. But God sees from this thumb all the way down to Sheol and from this finger all the way up to heaven, he sees the whole picture. And he'll talk to you about how to deal in this little space if you'll trust him as the one who has all wisdom. And when you say live, he may say die. And when you say work, he may say rest. And when you say die, he may say rise up and be alive. These, to the natural mind, these things are foolishness, but to the mind of God, they're the power and wisdom of God. It's the way of the cross. The wisdom of God is deep. Naaman comes to the prophet, wants to be healed of leprosy. The prophet says, we'll go dip seven times in the Jordan. Why? Because the one who sees the whole picture told him to. That's the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is deep, but it's not conventional. But it does work. Naaman was healed. The walls of Jericho fell to marching around seven days in a row and the seventh day, and you know the story. And what do they do? They shout, blow, shofarot. What happens? Brr, they're free. And they plunder the enemy because the wisdom of God is deep. And you can tip off all kinds of spiritual forces from heaven into a situation simply by obeying the unconventional wisdom of God. 
I can imagine another heavenly scene. An angel coming before the throne and saying, Father, you've shown us, or Lord God, you've shown us some of the things you're going to do in the last days and how your own son is going to have 12 full disciples, key apostles, representing Israel. They're going to preserve that promise and bless the nations. Which one is going to be the chief? Who's going to be the head guy out of the 12? The Lord points over to the Sea of Galilee. Two brothers are fishing. Simon's pulling up a catch, barking and whining, maybe even cussing. The Lord says, that's it. The angel says, Lord, are you sure? <laughs> the Lord says, the counsel of the Lord is sure. The wisdom of God is not conventional. It's deeper. You've got to tap in. Another angel looks at God's timeline, whatever they're allowed to see, and right on the threshold of the great last day's harvest, he sees this orange dot painted. He said, Lord, orange in the, in the 90s, in the new millennium? We could do that. Now, who's the mastermind you're going to raise up to head that thing? So the Lord points over to Long Island. Isn't that right? Some 15-year-old, long-haired, hippie, heroin addict. <laughs> playing some mushroom songs. <laughs> on an old drum set. That's my man. Lord, are you sure? The counsel of the Lord is sure. After hundreds and hundreds of years of Passover celebration, same thing. Only this night, it's the night of the Lord's Passover. The Lamb is going to be slain to save. And again, the angels look and they don't see a blemish free animal. They see a naked Jew spiked to a tree. One would have imagined some Roman god looking warrior coming to save his people. Or a great sea splitting. I mean, that's part of the drama of the Old Testament itself. But there was something deeper. In that crucified Jew is the wisdom and the power of God. And no angel dared ask that night, are you sure? The Lord stood up and offered the initiative himself. The counsel of the Lord is sure. Friends, the wisdom of God is wiser than men. And the foolishness of God, and, and, and the, excuse me, the wisdom of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Friend, don't be deceived. The wisdom of God is deep. It is inaccessible, inaccessible to the carnal mind. That's why we believers who are filled with the Spirit, we don't even always even pray in languages that we've learned because there's something we're crying out for that's deeper than our known vocabulary can touch. The wisdom of God for a full life that is successful in this life and the next, in the kingdom, is deep, inaccessible to the finger and to the mind of man. It is deep. So how do you tap in? You know how to tap in. Deep cries to deep. And finally, the wealth of God is deep. Oh, the depth of the riches of God. Do you realize that God the Father does not want his children to be poor in terms of the kingdom? and in terms of spiritual blessings. Do you realize that we are deeply wealthy and have all we need for life and godliness? We have, right now in this room, tons and tons more power than we even need to penetrate Islam. We have everything we need, and far more, because the wealth of God is deep. It's His very substance, it's the treasures of heaven. Paul said we're blessed with every spiritual blessing. Not most, or just what you can imagine. Everything you need 
has a spiritual blessing counterpart that can meet it if we can tap into that depth and believe. Friend, the wealth of God is deep. What do you think Jesus was working with when he put mud on a man's eyes? He was working with the wealth of God. How do you think he cleansed the leper's skin or raised the dead? He was working with the wealth of the substance of God's treasure chest. In Matthew 14, when uh, the, the crowd was listening to Jesus and they had been there for so long and the disciples said, look, it's late, everybody's hungry, let them go home. They need to leave and go get food. Jesus said, they don't need to leave. You give them something to eat. Now think about that a minute. He didn't stop and say, well now, hold on guys, I'm going to do a miracle. I'm going to prove what I can do in the Spirit. Jesus actually expected on their behalf that they had the wealth to feed those people. They knew how to tap in. You give them something to eat. What, we only got a few things. All right, bring what you have to me. And you know he fed every one of them and they were all satisfied. It was only what, is that the five loaves, two fish one? That's all there was. But Jesus saw more because the wealth of God is deep. Deep, 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 deep resources. My God will supply all of your needs, all of your needs. We lock that into finances, and I know missionary giving is the context, but Paul says all, so take all. What's your need tonight? Friend, the resources are right there. But you got to tap in. Come on now. I was flying back from England after a ministry trip. And who's from England here? Who's from England who's visiting? Raise your hand. Do you fly over Greenland when you come up? That's what we did that one time. We, we went up north a bit, right? Flew over Greenland and then started to come down. And um, I guess I don't get out much. But when I looked out my window and saw this sight, Greenland. By the way, I don't have a fetish for Greenland. Is there anybody here from Greenland? Revival in Greenland? Are there people in Greenland? I don't know, but I know what I saw. <laughs> this thing was magnificent. I mean, I'd never seen anything like it. I thought it was like supernatural or something. It was like eyeing a miracle. I don't, want, no, I don't know why everybody didn't jump over to that side of the plane to look over, like I did, just as, until I get my last view. Of it. it was amazing. And I'm not even the kind of person that likes just to go sit and look at things. This blew me out of the water. Like I said, they didn't want to look at it so much as I did. Maybe I don't get out much, so maybe this is just my testimony. <laughs> This was magnificent. I mean, these mountains were immense. They were huge. And they were just capped and, and sometimes just filled with all this snow. It was like crystal. It looked mythical. There was this mist woo, going through, you know. I could not. I didn't know anything like this existed. This has been here for hundreds, thousands of years. That, man, that water was like royal blue. Oh, icebergs were in the water and you could see the rest of the iceberg under the water they weren't huge icebergs but they were there man i thought i've never i've never dreamed something could be so beautiful this must be the playground of yahweh these must be i mean i want to come here when i can fly lord i just felt the spirit say you can fly praise god hope that was the spirit Ooh, I that's happened before. <laughs> it must be, these must be the high places. The prophets say the Lord comes down and treads. Ah. Man, and I started contemplating this. I thought, Lord, this has always been here, and I didn't know it. And the scripture says, I've seen the consummation of all perfection. But your commandment is exceedingly broad. One utterance from the side of the mouth of God is eternally greater than the grandeur you're beholding right now, son. You've seen a fraction. I thought, good night, how many other things like this are there to see on this earth? And this is only a fraction of the earth. A fraction of the earth I live on. 
And the earth is one planet in a galaxy with millions and millions of stars. And one galaxy with millions of stars is itself one of millions and millions and millions of other galaxies. And Job says of this immense creation, these things are but the fringes of his ways. And what think a word we hear of him? Tell me, who do you think we're dealing with when we raise our hands and say, show me your glory? Riki, where's your God? Lord, if that's the periphery, what's the inheritance look like? If that's the fence, what's in the house, man? I tell you in the name of Jesus Christ, before the angels, before the blood, before God, before the spirits of righteous men made perfect, that is what captivates me. And the only thing that'll satisfy me is the reality of the substance of God. What do you think these prophets had going? When Ezekiel looks out and sees a storm coming, ooh, and he looks closer and, oh, and it's the glory of God at the bottom. This awesome heavenly war chariot with these beings that can fly and not even move like normal flying things and the wheels and everything's alive. It had eyes, it had, even the wheels had spirit. And that wasn't even it. He looked above that and it was an expanse. He had to lift his vision higher. He had to go a little deeper. He looks up yet and, duh, the throne, and then there's God on the throne. These prophets weren't just given some sensational vision so that they could write. They were taken beyond the periphery into the deep. When John was caught up Remember the word in Revelation 4, come up here? And I'll show you what must take place after these things. And by the way, it doesn't say he got caught up, it just says he went into the Spirit. The Spirit's heaven on earth. I mean, I'm not saying he wasn't caught up, he probably was, but that's what it says. He was in the Spirit. And I saw a throne and one sitting on the throne. Friend, he was taken beyond the periphery. He was brought into the house. That's what a prophet is. That's what a prophetic people is. A people who have finally identified what they're really yearning for. To get inside the inheritance they were meant to have. The wealth of Yahweh God. This is true, man. And all of these things, this great vision of God, this throne, who knows what the throne looked like? He didn't describe the throne. Maybe it was like Solomon's, only magnified with heavenly multiplication, you know, ivory and gold from heaven. One who's the color of carnelian, like, like, like a stone of fire burning on the throne. An emerald rainbow around it. Four living creatures themselves barely describable. One of these things sticks its wing in this room and we're all down worshiping it. And they're servants of God. He was brought in, man. He was brought in where I want to go. That's the deep of God, where we belong. And this, this wealth, this substance, do you understand that it's the inner workings of God that these prophets and a prophetic people's brought into? It's, it's not just a vision for excitement so that you can run and share with people just to show how spiritual you are. It's God getting deeply Personal, because he's showing you his inner substance, his glory, the weight of who he really is. It says any pagan or believing, believing person can appreciate my majesty in nature, but the secret of the Lord is for those who fear him. You call on me, and I'll show you great and mighty things you don't know. I'll take you into the inner substance of God. I'll take you to the wealth of my glory. I'll take you to the real thing. That's what I want. And all of what John saw and what Daniel saw and what Ezekiel saw was all summed up in the twinkle of a young man's eyes as he preached in Israel. 
the kingdom of heaven is here. Repent and believe the good news. You can have it. Children, the Father is pleased to give you of this wealth and this glory. It's for you. Just nail everything of this life that's worthless any, anyway out of the way. Dig in deep and get violent and cry out for it. If the wealth of God is his inner substance, then what was really going on when Jesus shed his blood? I mean, the blood of Jesus Christ is not just a magic potion. It was the liquid soul of a young man that kept his body warm and gave him life while he was on earth. He had human blood just like you got human blood. The difference is his was pure, perfect blood. He had the DNA of God in it the seed of a new nation, the real Adam. Thank God that he laid his life down. And we sing about the blood, oh, the blood of Jesus. Do you realize what the blood of Jesus is? Can you give something more intimate and sacred than your blood? I mean, in a covenant marriage relationship, a man gives his seed to a woman. That is the, that is the peak of intimacy between a man and a woman. But there's a greater intimacy yet when a man gives his blood for a whole nation. That wasn't just a self-sacrifice. That was the deep of God inside his body. It was the wealth of his substance that he let out and poured out for you. It was very personal to him. And what about when God pours his spirit out? What is there more essential about a human being or God than his spirit? We say, we need another Pentecost. Show us your glory. Bring revival to our city. Do you realize you're asking God to bear his inner substance for you? And that it's a deeply personal and intimate act you're asking him to unveil for you? Do you want to know why prayer is one of the great keys to revival? Because God wants to know if you want me to pour out my deep, I want to know that you're willing to pour out yours because that's the kind of relationship I respond to. You want that inner wealth? It's not just a treasure hunt, though that analogy can be used. It's something deeply personal where we say nothing any longer will satisfy except the reality of the substance of God. And God says, well, then I'm a person. I'm a covenant person. I'm a deep person. You want me to respond to you with deep. I want you to respond to me with deep. What do you think about that? Some of us are so cheap. Show us, you better say that with me. Show us your glory. Do you just go sharing your intimate secrets with any passerby? Is God like a stripper? Just... Unveil yourself, Lord. On the mountain, Mount Sinai, he wouldn't even let good relationships go on. Three days, no women. This is different. This is a heavenly marriage I brought you out for. And then God revealed himself. And he, he did risk it because they didn't keep their end of the, of the covenant. They didn't understand. They still have Moses' face veiled, but thank God for Moses. Anyway, I want you to realize that if you can get to that place where you're tapping into depths that say, Lord, no longer am I satisfied except for your substance, you are going to get somewhere because God is a person. There is only one creature in all the universe that has the capacity for depth that Yahweh God has. It is Adam redeemed. He does not help angels. He helps the seed of Abraham. Because this is the only creature like him that can commune from his or her depths the way he can. That's why you're saved. Because you're the bride that is worthy of the bridegroom. You're the only one capable of satisfying his desire for communion with his creation. Think about this. When the Lord was wrestling with Jacob, it says 
he, the one wrestling, I know it's the Lord based on Psalm 24. He's also called a man. He's also called an angel. In, in, in uh, the story, he's called a man. In the psalm, he's called an angel. But in Psalm 24, it says, these are the ones who seek your face, even Jacob. And Jacob saw Peniel, the face of God. Why do we have a problem with God taking the form of a man and wrestling with Jacob anyway? That's my whole point. We've lost the depth of God because we've lost his humanity, that he really wants communion. Yes, he's eternal. Yes, he's from everlasting. Yes, he's not a creature, but he is now, but he's not. How could it be that the Lord could see, perceive in himself that this man is prevailing against me? Was it a physical matchup that God was losing? Probably not. That's proven by the little pop in the thigh there, the little socket. Limping for the rest of your life. It wasn't a physical match. It was deep to deep, man. It was desire for the holy to desire for the holy. It was communion for the eternal matched with communion for the eternal. Something in God that was lost in the garden when he said, Adam, where are you? Was satisfied to a degree when he wrestled with Jacob. And he said, now I have a man that I can change into a nation. Because if he could cry out from his deeps, depths, he'll touch my depths, I'll change him. That name is with us to this day, politically, geographically, and spiritually, for eternity. Because one man reached deep and wrestled all night and prevailed on God. Deep Christ to deep man. There's only two things that matter to me. I can sum up everything up in this. Everything else flows from that. It's to have communion with the deep reality of God in the midst of his people and to see authentic Christianity lived out on earth. That's it. I know everything else flows from that. And when my heart began to be stirred when I was an associate pastor in Port Washington, Wisconsin, I noticed, and I've said this several times, but I want to put it in this context with this with one thing added. I noticed that the way we did ministry was different than what I read in the Bible. I noticed that the results were different. Now, we ministered out of our revelation and out of our level of depth, and we're always obligated to do so. You, you reach out and you touch a lost and dying world with the revelation you got, and God will bless, and God will save, and God will do all this stuff. But if you really want to get busy, we need God, man. And so there were two things I did to try to line up what I saw in the Word and my own experience as a man and as a minister. Two things I did. One, I really studied the Scriptures simply. I was already going to a university to study them technically, but I just wanted to hear them speak, and I wanted to, to try to change things in my ministry to match what was going on in the Word. The other thing I did was I cried out. But I didn't know how to cry out for revival because I'm ashamed to say I didn't even really know what revival was. And I didn't even know who Leonard Ravenhill was, let alone read books. I mean, I'm sorry for my ignorance, but I had, no, I had absolute no knowledge of revival and what it meant, even as I read the Word, in a sense that I saw to, to, to see revivals in the Scripture. I didn't even see those, really, until God started to open my eyes later. So I didn't know what to do. I'd cry out all kinds of crazy stuff. I didn't even know what I was crying for. But there was something going on deep inside of me. And that's what God responded to. Because when I tried to force my plans to what the Word said, I found out you can't do God's plans without God. <laughs> Just because you know them, and you can work them out plastic superficially doesn't mean they're really happening. You've got to have God first. So, I, you know, eventually God showed me the, the thing you're minis missing in ministry is, 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 is Jesus. It's a new book. The key to ministry, God. <laughs> so my intensity to match up the form of ministry with the word diminished and my intensity to cry out to God increased. And almost out of instinct, 
I would go down into the basement of the church and I would pace and cry out. And I'd say, Lord, what is wrong? What is wrong? Why am I never at peace with the way we do things? Why is everybody else satisfied with their level of ministry? What is wrong with me? God, what am I doing wrong? What am I thinking wrong? Why am I not at peace? Your word says I should have peace when I pray. I don't have peace. I'm just not seeing it. It's just not right. Lord, help me. And I just, these are the only things I'd say. I wouldn't say anything complex. I wouldn't say anything theological. Because I was so frustrated. Thank God there was something deep in me that would not be satisfied until I saw the real thing. And in the midst of these kind of prayers that with my vocabulary were shallow, one day God electrified my whole body with a word. And he didn't rebuke me for my lack of faith, which I had a great lack of faith. I pray with greater depth now, but now I have expectation. I had no expectation then. Zilch. You say, well, brother, you should have had faith. Well, thank you very much for telling me that. I know that. But I did not, so there. What are you gonna, what are you gonna do? I didn't have faith. I didn't have that kind of faith, that expecting, speaking, confessing faith. I should have, but I did not. Nor did I have peace, but I prayed. I prayed from the very core of who I was as a human being who wanted God. That's all I did. It was, there wasn't any, even anything rhythmic about it. And one day out of the blue, God didn't rebuke me for lack of peace. He didn't rebuke me for lack of faith. He electrified my body with a word that said, I will bear my arm and you will see it. I thought, good night. I mean, it was like echoes inside my body. I've never heard God that clearly. I'm not sure I've heard him that clearly since. He just overwhelmed me with a word. I didn't know what to do with myself. He's, you're going to see, you're going to see an explosion. You are going to be in awe, and you'll be, to, be able to testify that salvation belongs to our God. And you're going to see it, young man. You're going to see it. He spoke that to me. I didn't know anything. It was before Toronto. I didn't even know those things existed. I didn't even know there was such a thing. All I knew is my AG history, Azusa Street. And, you know, all that happened for was for the, to create these summons of God. So that's done. So I didn't know there was anything else left. I didn't know it was part of a long history, God marching through history. I didn't know that. I didn't know anything. And I was praying out of frustration. But what my ears heard me pray was coming from here. But what God heard was coming from here. Ha! And I got results. I'm not up here for nothing now. Something's right. And it wasn't a formula. It wasn't a hype session. It was deep. Crying to deep. And God apparently appreciated it. Robo shukabadi. And he responded, just like he's going to respond to you. Just like he's going to respond to our school. Oh, man, if you could polish it off and just boil it down, one thing I ask, that's what I'll seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, the Spirit of God's rising in this place. To behold the beauty of the Lord, the inner substance of God, and that I might meditate in his temple. Friends, some of you got to tap in tonight and thank God for the trial and the problem and the weight you brought in here so that it can become an excuse for you to say, I have decided that this need will be met supernaturally by God or it shall not be met at all. Others of you are going to have to tap in a little deeper and come up with a few different languages you haven't learned before. I don't care who you are, because that's when you're praying from deep. Others of you, all of you, are going to have to go in even deeper than languages you don't know to groanings that are too deep for languages. And not just producing the sounds but focusing your inner eye on the Lord and saying, you are all that will satisfy me. You are all. And I am willing to put cries to my desires. No longer will we give our hearts to the things of this world, 
right? No longer will I find satisfaction in gorging my body. No longer will I find satisfaction if you're away from God with illicit sexual affairs, masturbation, homosexual tendencies. No longer will I be addicted to sports. I'm going to define my need in the presence of God. And out of that need, I'm going to cry from deep. Friend, and if it's not deep enough, then cry from deeper. And then you tell me if he does not respond. In Jesus' name, everybody please stand. And those of you with the chairs, move them to the right and to the left. Friend, this ain't no show. This is the house of God. This is the place where hungry children eat at the table that God has prepared in the presence of his enemies. Come on, Charles, brother, play something in the background for me right here if you can. I hope you heard the word of the Lord tonight. Now you respond, saying, I don't feel that deep. You just spoke out of your deep friend. Just speak yourself. Be genuine and start talking to God. Where is Yahweh, the God of Elijah? Maybe God will come in this place tonight. Maybe God will blow your cancer or your AIDS out of the water. Maybe God will strain your limbs, set you free from addiction. Deep cries to deep, friends. <clears throat> Hungry church people, leaders, students. Maybe God will give you a vision and a dream. Maybe God will give you a fresh anointing. Maybe God will break your heart and give you greater understanding. Maybe your life will change tonight forever because you want it and have cried deep unto deep. Oh yeah. You better not just be sitting there distracted if you know you should be praying. If you're outside, if you don't understand what we're doing right now, friends, we bless you, we welcome you. We don't require anything of you. But if you belong to the household of Yahweh, you should be digging deep and finding some desire. This ain't religion. This is human. This is blood. This is spirit. God, you are all we want. You're all we need, Lord. Those distant from you, those close to you, Lord, you are an eternal wealth of resources, knowledge, and wisdom. Lord, even our sin, we can cry out and receive forgiveness. Even our addiction, we can cry out and receive deliverance. Even a fresh anointing, a new revelation, a new place and space. For our ministry at Brownsville, Lord, you are all we need. By the great Holy Spirit. Lord, we don't want to be released yet, Lord. We don't want to be released yet, Lord. We want to come and find forgiveness. We want to find a new depth. Hey, yeah! Mo kabaka, ne shikia ya bablebeke. Uribini mi mama chama mama ne mi We are human. We're the generation of those who seek him. Lord, deepen our capacity. From 
come deep within, friend. Tell him what you really want. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. To behold your beauty, oh God, oh God, oh God, your face, Father. The robes of your righteousness, Lord Jesus. Don't pass us by tonight, Lord. Freedom for the captive, oh God. Recovery of sight to the blind, Lord. There's a song rising, it's supernatural. Councils in the heart of man are like a deep well. A man of wisdom draws it out. Friend, you may be away from God and not even understand what's going on. But I know that I know that you're pierced with conviction and guilt over your sin. And I want you to know that if you'll find a place of prayer right now and believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and cry out for forgiveness and turn away from your sin, you shall be saved and your cry will echo into eternal life. I don't care what your parents have told you, God will take you up right now. I don't care if your parents have told you you're worthless and you don't know anything. God's gonna tell you something different. You talk to him right now from your depths. Lord, we don't want you to release us yet, Lord. We don't want you to go until you've blessed us, Lord. Friend, if there's something that's been plaguing you, just make it an excuse in the face of the devil to cry out to God for a touch of his knowledge, wisdom, or wealth, friend, it's all there. Turn to the Lord and be saved tonight. You may be clean with the Lord and burdened for a nation. Friend, this is the moment you can bring villages down by your deep cries right now. Cry out for your nation. God has given you this moment. Once we get to that point, those are the songs I'd like, but please be led. Lord, I just want more of you. I want your voice crisper to my heart. I want a greater freedom and liberty in my prayer time, Lord, and I'm willing to fight for it. I'm willing to go through the wilderness, Lord, but I'm going to cry from deep until you answer me. Friend, I don't even know that's what I was doing, but that's what I was doing. And it worked because my father saw and he heard and he came. You know, the same applies for you. Jesus, in the days of his flesh, he cried out, he prayed to the one with tears who was able to save him from death. Friend, deep cries to deep. This is what you've been born for. This is what you've been born again for. He come up. Jesus. Some of us here tonight, you say, my, my, my commitment is sometimes just skin deep. I feel so superficial. Sometimes my burden is just so skin deep. I feel so superficial. Sometimes my hatred of sin is skin deep. I feel so superficial. My love for other people is just skin deep. My purity, my faith, it just seems skin deep. I just seem so shallow. I seem so superficial. How do I change to change by coming forward and humbling yourself and saying, God, God, strip away the superficiality and take me deeper. Wound me for life that I live dependent on you. God, I don't want to be superficial. I want to be up one day and down the next. I don't want to be fearing you one day and playing games the next. 
I don't want to be on fire one day and complacent the next. God, I want to be deep. I want to be deep. God, take me deeper. Take me deeper in prayer. Take me deeper in intimacy. Take me deeper in purity. Take me deeper in passion. Take me deeper in commitment. Take me deeper in sacrifice. Take me deeper in holiness. Take me deeper in faith. Take me deeper in understanding. Take me deeper in knowledge. Take me deeper in compassion. Take me deeper in you. Take me deeper in you. Cry out, people of God. Wherever you are, start where you are, and God will take you in. Lord, we want you to be more real to us, Lord. We want the eyes of our hearts open up, not just the eyes of our heads, Lord, the eyes of our hearts deep within us, Lord, to perceive your love, to perceive your compassion, to perceive your presence, God. This is the inheritance of the children, friends. The Lord is my portion. Friend, this is, this is one of the most, if not the most human thing you can do. Just be yourself in all honesty before God. Lord, if you're all that you say you are, then pour your spirit on me. My ground is dry, and you're the one that satisfies. No longer these temporary things, Lord. Only what I absolutely need. But Lord, you are the one that can touch me deeper. Friend, heaven is the limit when you begin to relate to God that way. And the most precious thing of it all will be him himself. It will not just be what he'll do for you or even the revival, those things will come. It will be Jesus, it'll be the Father of glory. He come, oh, Lord, even as we go farther and more effective in ministry, Lord, be pleased to have simple fellowship with us. Let that be your and our greatest joy and let everything else flow from there, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord, we just continue in His presence, friends. And this thing's going to swell again in a few moments. But even as God is speaking to you back out of his deep, receive it, and the thing's going to swell in a few moments again as we respond. God is love. You don't have your needs because you're weird. You have your needs because you've been created to find satisfaction in God. We'll find it again. Deep cries to deep. Yes, even you. Yes, even on those issues that seem so mundane and plain. Friend, if you'll cry out to God, that's what he wants. Lord, for my, for my husband, for my wife, Lord, for my church, oh God, for my unsaved family member, Lord, for that secret place with you that I've yearned for, Lord, that I haven't seemed to touch, that's what I cry out for. 
Call upon me and I'll answer you. I'll show you great and mighty things you don't know.
make your appeal to God tonight, friend. This is not something you earn. Make your appeal to God tonight. Anything you know that's displeasing, just lay it down. Anything you know that's unclean, lay it down. Any wrong direction in your life, just turn from it, end it, seal it, goodbye, good night, done with. Now say, Lord, here I am, I'm going after you. Lord, here I am, I want to be more like you. Lord, here I am, I'm crying out. And if you say, go left, go left. If you say, go right, I'll go right. Whatever it is, Lord, I want to please you. I want to live for you. I want to glorify you. God, I'm calling out from the depth of my heart to the depth of your soul. Make yourself known. Make yourself known. Remove from me everything that stands in the way and make yourself known. Take me deeper. Take me deeper. Make your appeal to God. He is near to the brokenhearted. The prayer of the righteous is his delight. If you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you.